Hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Paul. And we're going to challenge you to transform your financial future through the principles of the most profitable business in the world, banking. We believe everyone should be involved in two businesses, the business that you're in and the banking business. Everyday people can replicate what bankers have been doing for centuries to leverage capital and build wealth through private lending. Join us as we uncover the truths about money, expose lies and myths, and flip conventional financial advice on its head. Here we go. All right, Paul, welcome back, buddy. Hey, so you sent me some pictures yesterday. Uh, and I, did? I didn't believe you. Yeah, of uh, yeah, you did. That... <laughs> oh yeah, I did. Yeah, why don't you tell us about your most recent purchase here? Yeah, so we're sitting down there in Florida visiting our families, both Tammy's family and my family, and uh, her dad. You know, he bought a '69 Chevy Camaro several years ago, and he want he's like, hey, you want to go see where I bought it? And I was like, sure, I'll go up there with you. Well, he always has like ulterior motives, and so we walk into this place, and I'm a for people who are into cars, I'm a Mopar guy. I like Chrysler products from the 60s and 70s. Um, and, and, and today, obviously, the Hellcat. But um, so I walk in there, and there's a 70 Plymouth Cuda 383 four speed in lemon twist, which is yellow. Ticket That's me pretty yellow, cool color. basically. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's cherry, man. It's full rotisserie re restoration. It's a matching, yeah, numbers matching car. So the transmission's original, um, the engine's original that came in the car, carburetor, the whole bit. And I was like, oh gosh. I was like, uh oh. Anyway, <laughs> wait. So you you didn't go there expecting to buy a car? No. Okay. No, I, I totally didn't. And I so and I really like an, should. An impulse purchase. Yeah, it's calculated. something that I've. It is calculated for sure. They, the Mopars have gone up in value over the last uh, uh, few years because um, yeah. they're they're more rare uh, than like a GM or a Ford. But uh, in in the end, this is a car that I'm going to leave as part of my legacy, right? Cause my, my son's into cars. My daughter is to an extent as well. And yeah, so this will be, this will be his car someday that he'll, that I'll leave to him. But uh, anyway, it's, it's awesome. I can't wait. That's to... cool. I'm going to start calling you Dominique Toretto. There just you call go. you Toretto, <laughs> Paul Toretto Fougere. Yeah. If anybody catches that reference. Yeah. Gosh, I'm I got age, it. Are we? Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. Yeah. When you sent me those pictures, I was like, no, you didn't. Yeah. Like, I bought this. Like, no, you didn't. And then you show me a picture of you standing next to it and basically laying on the hood. Okay, cool. <laughs> Congratulations. You have, what, uh, half a dozen cars now? You could always use more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I again, they're they're all calculated. I don't just do things willy-nilly. Right. Um, so. You've got the capital. I mean, you have the capital to pay cash. Whether you did or not is, is completely up to you, but you have the capital to do so. Well, according to that one comment, I should be doing velocity banking. <clears throat> yeah, that uh, that comment we got on our YouTube channel. Apparently, you guys haven't heard of velocity banking. We might have to address that at some point. Yeah, Just maybe. for the record, if you do listen, we know exactly what velocity banking is and how to do it. Yeah, and I've got a client who does that, and he started with that, and then it led him to IBC, and now he's kind of combining the two. And, it, you know, it, it's working out really great for him. Um, right. You know, because yeah, most people use his house. Most yeah. people use HELOCs to do it, but yeah. I, I, yeah. life insurance policy loan is a better better way to do it, obviously. Sure. You can bank with a HELOC, sure, um, but it's it's not the superior product or uh, no. asset to bank with. Yeah. Nope. Well, cool, man. Um, hey, I wanted to, let's tell a client success story. So we had one of our clients write in, sent us an email, it just gave us like a little success story, which this is awesome. I love getting these because it's like, hey, man, people are really grasping this and they're opening their eyes and their their creativity is going and they're finding better ways to utilize their capital and to sequence their capital. So this client, <clears throat> he says um, he's talking about his mortgage escrow and he's like, it, it made me think about how I could sequence those mortgage escrow funds like the tax escrow funds, if I manage my own property and tax hazard insurance. He said, the background is last month I received a notification that my mortgage would increase because my escrow was short funds. His insurance went up this year. Uh, Alaska property taxes are a moving target, so he wasn't surprised, but just frustrated that that money was being leveraged by someone else's bank while it was just sitting there for six months ready to be paid. Because that's how mortgage 
in um, taxes work. They're paid semi-annually. So that money sits and accumulates in somebody else's bank for six months. And then that bank sends the check. And they're like, you know, we're doing you a service here because you don't have to think about it. You don't have to write that check and, and keep track of it, right? Um, but he goes on to say, hey, this probably isn't awe-inspiring like some of your other stories, but I reached out to my bank and inquired if I could close my escrow and manage my own tax and insurance payments. Given my on-time payment history and equity in the house, they approved it in relatively short order. So beginning 1 Jan, I'll have just over $12,000 a year that I can sequence into policies first. Congratulations. That is, that's awesome, right? He just created a new uh, opportunity to open another uh, branch of his bank with money that's leaving his, his economy anyway. He's just sequencing it into his own bank first. How cool is that? And, you know, he's a smart guy. Um, so, John, keep keep it up. But exactly, I think the one thing about our clients that really get into IBC and, and really dig deep is they're looking at things in a different way, Dave. I think they're, they see the landscape in a different way. And the question becomes, once you really understand what's going on, is how can I sequence my money better, right, to advantage what is, you know, my personal economy, right? Um, so sp spot on use. And I think when we talk about people sequencing a tithe through a policy, if they tithe through their church annually or sequencing, we've talked about taxes. So this is just another example with the escrow and most, most he's lucky his lender allowed him to do this, right? Cause we're not in control of that banking function if we have a mortgage. Right. So right. luckily maybe it's a local lender up there that he has a good relationship with. They were, he's allowed to split that out. But normally when you carry a note, a lot of the times they won't let you, they want you to have, you have to have an escrow. Right. Because if you don't pay those property taxes, um, it's going to cause a mess for them that's as right. well. So, yeah. So, hey, yeah. Congratulations, John. That's great, man. Keep sending those stories in. Even if it seems little to you, it's, it's kind of a big deal because that may open the eyes of somebody else who's got a policy and they're in the exact same situation. And frankly, anybody who's got a mortgage can call their lender and say, Hey, can I cancel this escrow and do it on my own? So the worst they can say is no, right? That's right. So the answer is always no until you ask. Um, and that's a great example of, of really not overthinking it either. So I've got um, a couple other clients who, who have reached out with questions about, you know, some people have different buckets, different savings accounts where they put vacation savings, you know, or education, or like all these different segments, right? And now they're instead throwing all of that into a policy. So their savings account is in their policy, but it's all jumbled together now, right? Um, so some people struggle with, hey, how do I segregate what's for, you know, what's what inside when I put all of my different savings accounts into a single account? Um, and maybe that's something we can get into in, in more depth um, in another episode, but I'll just say to that one, don't overthink things. You know, people can make this as complicated as they want to be, but you can keep it pretty simple. Hey, it's just another place to put my money until I'm ready to use it, whatever yep. that use may be. And it's seemingly the same amount of dollars and dollars that they already had that right. were already earmarked for something. Um, if anything, they're simplifying things, Dave. We've talked about this in the past where, you know, I've had friends that have talked about the the envelope method or the, I have a different debit card for groceries than I do I for used clothing. to do that. I did that for right. a, a year, maybe two years. Yeah. And I think that is just insane. Uh, maybe it works for some people, but you know, my wallet only holds 12 cards. I don't want any, I don't want any more. That's, that's enough. 12 different, you know, IDs and credit cards and whatever. Right. Um, in this, by doing it this way, I, I like the consolidation of my wealth where I'm not, don't think of this as putting all your eggs in one basket, but you're you're simplifying just where it is. Like, hey, I need to go on vacation. All right, we're going to the family banking system and we're gonna take policy loan out and boom, pay for that vacation. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, I think it's just simplification of, and you know, we all, and I think we all need that. Yeah, yeah, I, I like consolidation and and simplification. Those are two great qualities uh, that the infinite banking can really do for you if you don't mm -hmm. muck it up by, by overthinking things. Yeah, when it comes to you know vehicle financing, eventually doing trading on a mortgage, college education, 
legacy planning, tithe, mm -hmm. vacation. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. Great. Well, that's, that's a great start. So you mentioned a word earlier when you were talking about that new CUDA you purchased, uh, you said legacy. So that's, that's a part of your legacy that you're leaving to maybe Anthony, right? And, and you're not just going to leave the car to him. What else are you leaving when it comes to that car? Yeah, part of the reason, well, I'm glad he, he's interested in cars because because I am and his both his grandfathers are and his, uh, one of his great-grandfathers was. Anyway, um, so yeah, part of my bringing him up there was to to know that, hey, this is not this is not to be done willy-nilly. We're just going and buying liabilities left and right. Um, this is this is why I'm able to do this without without question, without being like, oh, am I going to be able to afford uh, the grocery bill this month because I bought this car that I don't need? Right. Um, and I talked to him through those things of, hey, I'm able to save. We save a lot of money. And we put it in a place where we can get to it to do the things that we would like to do or need to do, whether that's buy liabilities like a classic car, which eventually could, could be turned could into be an, an asset. asset. Yeah, for sure. It's they're not making any more 1970 Cudas. Right. Um, but so I think the like like you said, the education is is so huge, and he understands that he has a dividend paying whole life insurance contract that we pay premium on, and that is going. And I show them every year it grows. I'm like, hey, last year it had this much cash value and death benefit. This year it has this much. So they under, understand that. Um, so yeah, the education is is likely the most important part of all of this legacy planning is how to think about money and what to do with your money and where to put it. Yeah, that's a perfect example because legacy means a lot more than just money. I think when we uh, when we talk about infinite banking and then the mechanics of we talk about creating generational wealth. Right. And I think a lot of times we don't spend enough time defining what wealth means. And wealth goes far beyond just dollars, dollars and cents and, and assets. Um, with those families that really spend time on legacy planning, uh, what what is it? You know, most, I, I saw a stat the other day. It takes like less than three generations for a family to, to completely use up all the wealth that they inherited. You know, if it gets inherited from one generation to the next, by generation three, it's gone, uh, typically. Right? Yeah, so it's even those... Yeah, even the Vanderbilt burned, you know, generation three and four burned through all of it. Right. Yep. And it's gone. Right. They have to go get a, a job at CNN now to, to pay the bills. Because <laughs> they now they got Anderson <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's carrying on the family legacy there. So, um, so that legacy planning, and I, I just started reading a book. It's over here called Entrusted, Building, Building a Legacy That Lasts. Because this year, I really want to get heavy into understanding trusts and the way trusts play a part in that legacy planning, which I think they're vital for proper legacy planning. And I'm going to get really um, in the weeds on that early this year so I can put that in place for my family. Um, and, you know, it's going to pay major dividends. And I think we need to get like a trust expert on the show at some point, because I think that's a so it's a huge valuable uh, or value add to everybody is understanding the role that can play in your legacy planning and while you're alive and while after you're gone. So, you know, directing um, your wealth from beyond the grave is a pretty cool idea. Yes, I, I think especially if, you know, let's face it, we all hope that our children um, adopt our, at least how we think about money and how we manage money. And, you know, everyone knows that Dave's like the cheapest person ever. Um, yeah. Most people, anybody who knows me well knows that. Yeah. Which I didn't put that together until I was at your wedding. And of course, all <laughs> the, all the guys that he's known longer than I've known, known you, uh, we're I've got saying, a reputation oh, yeah. to, to uphold man. Right. Um, so the, the least cheap thing I've ever done is, is that wedding. So I spent a lot yeah, of money and last it was, year. And it was beautiful. It was very nice, Thank very you. nicely done. 
And uh, the honeymoon was nice. But too. anyway, yeah. But anyway, I lost my train of thought when I had to bust your chops there about the wedding. But um, yeah, it's okay. Um, I mean, just going back to legacy planning. So, what does legacy mean to you? So, if you had to say, you know, this is what legacy means, and this is the this is what I want my children. And you don't have to get into you what, what you want them to carry on, but you know, what does legacy planning mean to you? Obviously, it means more than just I'm going to leave them a lot of money, you know, income tax free money when I graduate from this earth. Like they're right. they're not going to have any issues. Um, but that there's pros and there's cons to that. So you know, what do you and think when you when you hear legacy? <clears throat> well, that's where the trust comes into place. Um, yeah, I just I just regained it what I uh, what I lost about 30 seconds ago. So anyway, talking about I don't want to necessarily be like oh, I'm controlling the money from the grave, but I do want to have some, you know, limited use clauses in there where it has to be for something, you know, you need to do something productive with the money. You can't mm-hmm. just willy nilly blow it on whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah, Dave, to me. Kuda. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's, you know, maybe it's a Hemi car. Maybe it's 426 Hemi you know, Hemi Kuda, which there's only a, f- a few hundred of those left. So, Valid. Um, but they're, you know, one, one sold at Meekum a few years ago for three and a half million dollars. So there it is. All right. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't buy one of those. Uh, <clears throat> so it's the education for me. It's the, and, and, and part of that, not only the financial education, but the, the history of money, the history of, of how governments throughout the ages, what they have done to devalue currency and debase it, all the going, going back to the Roman Empire. Um, and now we see it with our own, you know, Federal Reserve System. Understanding all of those, all of those elements to create a, you know, a holistic view of, ah, that's why dad was so adamant about putting our money in a private asset class. Because anyone can buy dividend paying whole life insurance. No, I'm not concerned about the death benefit. I just want the cash value and I want to make, you know, break even in year three and only pay premium for 10 years or whatever so I can go invest in real estate. And James always says, right. life settlements, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> always makes me laugh. But it, there's so much more to it than that, right? That, yeah. that as, you, as you read Nelson and you read all the books that, that he has recommended us to read, there's so much more to this, um, and it all goes back to knowing what's going on. So I, I want my children to understand what's going on. And if they do, and they really understand, they'll know what to do. Yep. Right. And I, knowledge. So knowledge is a major component to that legacy. You know, in, in addition to that, I'd say values, family values. What are our family values that, that you know, we want? The, the generations to, to carry on. Um, but, you know, let's go back to the wealth because that's what we talk about on the show mostly is, so I, I think there's a lot, there's two schools of thought, I think primarily with people. They're like, well, I want to leave, you know, everything to my kids because I don't want it to go on to anybody else. And then there's another school of thought from some actually pretty well-known people like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, um, and, and I'm sure others who say, well, I mean, they're going to get a fraction of my wealth, you know, and they have to use it on education or something like that. The rest of my wealth is going to these different charities or, you know, um, you know, funds, uh, buying foundations, up farmland. foundations, yeah. Buying farmland and starting medical companies. Um, so yeah, we won't get into that. Um, but so I, I'm of the, the, the mindset that I want to leave it to my family. Uh, and, but I don't want to just give it all to them as a lump sum payment. Hey, here you go. Go crazy. Right. Cause that, that's a, a blessing and a curse. Probably more often than not, it would be a curse unless yep. those, those heirs are properly trained and knowledgeable. But you know, what if you graduate early, uh, earlier than you should, and your kids are 25, when they get all that money, what would you have done when you were 25? Like how many cars would you own by now? Um, oh gosh. Right. <clears throat> so yeah, it'd be a problem. Yeah. So, you know, you could demotivate, you know, kill any ambition somebody has. Um, 
but ideally my kids, uh, yeah, <clears throat> set a properly proper legacy planning starts with knowledge and values and then money. Cause if you have those other two in place, then, you know, what, what do people say? You know, money just reveals more of who you are. So if, if you're an idiot, you're going to be a bigger idiot with a lot of money. No question. Right. If, yep. if you're, if you're giving, um, charitable, if you're, uh, intelligent and always looking to, you know, create value, then more money is probably going to do all of those things too. So, yeah. 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 Um, well, let's talk about what Nelson talked about. So get your books out, everybody, uh, cause we know you all have them. Um, turn fifth edition, page 71, Nelson talks about an even distribution of age classes. Now, this is a really cool concept. And Nelson didn't only, he didn't just write about this. Like Nelson lived this uh, a, a couple years ago during the Think Tank, which is coming up in February. So we're actually, we need to buy our plane tickets. Yes, we do. <clears throat> yeah. So, but a, a couple years ago, this was right, you know, the year after Nelson graduated. So it was the first Think Tank without Nelson there. So it was a really emotional time, especially for those who were really close to him. Um, but you know, people got up and told their stories, and one of them was this very thing: the distribution of age classes, where they showed all the policies Nelson owned, who he owned them on, and how that like it, it's just carrying on from generation to generation. He started it all, and and that's amazing. I think you and I were talking before this about that, and you know why? How is that such a powerful thing? to use these dividend paying whole life insurance to create that ongoing legacy for generations to come. Like, how does that actually work? Yeah, <clears throat> this, uh, I was thinking about this while we we're in Florida and, uh, you know, it's really, it is quite simple, right, Dave? You know, I always tell people cause they're always rushing. They think I need to insure my kids and you, and you do. Yeah. But the majority of premium should be on the most insurable generation generating an income in that case in our case yeah. dave right our parents are in their late 60s early 70s so you know it's it's a little late not saying yeah, it's too late but sense. it's yeah right so we discovered ibc right you discovered it and then you know waited about 10 years and then told me about it so great <laughs> hey, better hey, late than never better late than never right right um so i like hey let's start with the generation that acquires the knowledge. And if, gosh, if our parents are, if our parents are in our fifties or early sixties, maybe there is, maybe it is worth looking at them uh, to ensure. But the bottom line is Dave, you get in a generation in our case, our generation buys life insurance. We try to get to our full human life value, which at our age is, you know, 25 times our income, let's say. Um, yeah, let me, let me our, hit on that real quick. Human life value, yeah. your human life value is going it's to not, grow throughout yes, your life, right? Not because static. you're, it's not static. You're going to acquire more assets. Ideally, you're going to, you know, create more income as you get older and have a bigger paycheck coming in every year. Right. So revisit your human life value. You wouldn't buy a, a $200,000 house and then, you know, pop the top on it, add a second story to it and not up the insurance amount on it. Right. Because yeah, now you've double increased. the value. Yeah. You're not going to keep it valued or insured at only two hundred thousand dollars. That would be stupid. It's the same thing with your life. You're you're adding more stories, more floors, more um, add-ons. You know, more square footage. Goes, more square footage. Well, ho hopefully not around the waist, but you're adding more <laughs> square footage in this example as the years progress. So you need to add more insurance. Okay, sorry, I, I probably right. broke your train of thought there, but no, it's totally fine. That's a great. That's a great point. Like I'm always looking to add more policies on myself or Tammy or not the kids, not yet. Right. Cause juvenile policies aren't super efficient anyway. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I mean it will them. be, they are, it will be. but when they're the, our they, age, yes, yeah, no question for sure. Um, but if you're insurable and you're the one that's discovered this, what's, let's get you full human life value insured if we can, and if, yeah. or we build up to that as income increases, we keep expanding system. So Dave, you and I are eventually going to graduate. Okay, and just like Nelson's example that David was talking about at the last think tank was, you know, he gets a phone call, say, hey, you have any room in your policies? What does that mean, everybody? That means, hey, I've got some policy loans out. Yep. So this is like, you know, I'm calling up Anthony 40 years from now. Hey, you've got room in your policies? Well, I got pneumonia. Expect a windfall. 
Yeah. Right. Perfect. So what that does, that fills his policy or policies up his system of policies that he's that he's been using for family banking. So Anthony's good now, and mm -hmm. Carmelo's good now. They filled up their loans. Now they've got what's left over. Let's say it's millions of dollars. Now what do they do? Well, they likely just increased their net worth. Maybe they doubled their net worth. So now they have room for to add more policies, assuming they're insurable, or maybe yep. they add policies on their own children, right? So they expand their system. The cool thing is, Dave, this is the, the real legacy piece that I like, is they've got premium dollars that they don't have to labor for or trade out, you know, to get a rate of return, right? It's money that they have and they got it income tax free. Now it's just mm -hmm. sitting there. Now I can pay, now they can pay premium with that on either yeah. their lives or their children's lives or grandchildren's lives, maybe by, by that point, whatever. So it becomes, if every generation does exactly that, you end up with, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but it's, you ultimately end up with free life insurance, assuming you're insurable, right? Like you're right. I inherited $5 million. Okay, great. Now I can use that to pay premium. Yeah. Or, you know, use that to go buy some assets that generate income, income every year paper. that goes toward premium. Right. Right. Amazing. That's right. You can do it yeah. many different ways, I suppose, for sure. Yep, exactly. So, and that's what it but, means. Uh, so I know, you know, Nelson owned something, you know, 40 something policies, I believe it was throughout his life. Yeah. But you know, those are not just on him, all his immediate family members, kids, grandkids, you know, um, in-laws, children-in-law, um, all of that. And, and you know, all the way down, like the youngest kid, soon as soon as somebody's born, bam, policy. Yep. Um, because that goes back to one of these on page seventy-two. Nelson talks about um, the significant advantages to this plan, and one of those is um, underwriting problems are minimized. Oh hey, boy! The sooner you can get insured, and man, have I seen that a lot in twenty twenty-two over yep. the last year? I've had so many people either decline straight up or get table rated which is a sub, you know, substandard rating um, or something like that, which, you know, if they would have just gone through a couple years ago, you know, maybe when they were in their 20s or early 30s, they wouldn't have had those issues. But it's, that's just the way it is. As you get older, you know, there's more opportunity for bad things to happen to your body and your health. Yep. So the sooner the better. Um, yeah, what are some other of these significant advantages? Yeah, I mean, that's a big one. He put that one as... Uh... You know, obviously, we covered the multiple multiple generations. Again, we're reading from page seventy two in the right side. He's just got like a little bulletized summary of why this mm -hmm. is a great idea, right? Um, you know, tax free buildup of cash values over a long period of time. Oh, I like this one, Dave. I I have this underlined for some reason, and I can't tell you I didn't date it. But outlay is very small compared with the ultimate yield. So what he's saying there, folks, is the dollars paid in premium especially on a juvenile policy when you, I just opened up one on a two month old baby. The, the amount of premium that that man eventually has paid over his lifetime relative to his uh, cash value and death benefit is minuscule. Oh, the yeah. death benefit and cash value is many, 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 many times over what he's paid in premium. And it's none of it's going to be taxed assuming he uses it correctly with loans. And it just gets better the longer he lives. Every year you oh. live, the better it gets. It's crazy. And it's a small one, right? It's $2,000 a year premium. That's it. Yeah, which is, which is plenty to make an incredible difference yep. when, when he's an adult you yep. know, or retired, you know, creating a tax-free income. So, yeah. Um, generation paying the premiums can most easily afford them. So as, um, as you create these policies on your children, at some point, you can hand the ownership over to your children. You know, right. when, when I'm retired or, you know, in my passive income years, even though I'll have a lot more money coming in than I do now, because that's what I'm planning for. Um, I don't have to pay that premium. I can just say, Hey, Hey Jack, here you go. Here's your policy. You know how to use it. Cause, cause you, you know, I've trained you and you've taken that to heart. You can start paying the premium on it now. And who's not going to want to pay that $2,500 a year premium when every time he pays that premium, his cash value goes up by like $10,000. Right. I right? do that all day. Pretty yeah, pretty sure he's going to want that. Um, so, yep. And, and like you alluded Do to before, day. when the death benefit occurs, uh, the system becomes self-sustaining at that point because that tax-free 
income, income tax-free payout comes to those generations and replenishes and, and creates more policies, right? And as long as people keep doing it's, that, it never has to end. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. But you can't abuse that system though, but it is, it, um, you know, Dave, this something that we, that we talked about is how many people have you talked to over the last few years in this business where they're our age, but their parents are now 72 and a half years old and they've got you know, RMDs required minimum distributions coming out of a 401k and they don't need the money. And my answer to them, and I don't know if they ended up doing it this is because this particular person I'm thinking about has since become an agent. I was like, man, that's, that should be premium on you and your children. Absolutely. And they own the policy. They transfer ownership upon graduation. Um, yep. What a great storage facility for that money. And then they still have access via the, you know, cash value policy loan if they need it. Right. Um, yep. Something, just something to think about for people that are taking RMDs that don't need them. Yep. Or inherited exactly. IRAs or for, you got to take that. You're, you're going to, if you don't need that money, it's going to sit somewhere in somebody else's bank. So it might as well be premium and yep. creating a legacy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, this precludes any need for social security. So if you can retire and start taking tax free income from the cash value of your life insurance policies, eventually, you know, if everything goes like it should, and your parents predecease you, you're going to receive that windfall and be able to replenish all of that tax free income you've been taking over your retirement years and fill it all the way back up and probably give yourself a pay raise in retirement and start taking bigger chunks every yep. year. So what a, what a great retirement uh, strategy there. Yeah. I underline that too. Uh, Cause that goes hand in hand with the next, next bullet is passive income is assured. Yeah. It's a, it's guaranteed. You know, I guaranteed. Like that. That's a better word than assured, but they mean yep. the same thing, but yeah, it's guaranteed. Right. Um, estate planning is simplified. So, Hey, here's cash. Yeah. Done. It creates, <laughs> it literally creates an estate. It does create an estate. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I was thinking, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Secretariat with uh, Diane Lane and uh, it's, I don't know, 15 years old now or whatever, but part of the problem with that whole horse farm was was inheritance tax when oh, right. the father died. They wouldn't, you know, so they had to, and luckily Secretariat became a big horse and they studded him out and blah, 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 but um, you know, the greatest horse ever. But I was thinking, I was like, man, if he had had proper whole life insurance, you know, been fully insured for the value of of, of all of his wealth that he had created that mm -hmm. had been in horses and land and whatever, um, maybe that wouldn't have been an issue. But I, I don't know. They didn't cover that in the movie. But uh, my guess is he didn't have adequate life insurance. I think that's a major problem facing a lot of families these days with land, you know, farmland or something like that, yeah. passing it on to the generations and figuring out. You know, most of these kids don't farm anymore. They went off right. and got jobs, and they're like, right. "Now we got, now we got to sell this land, or and you know, lose a ton of money in taxes, or we keep it and we have to pay inheritance tax." I don't know. I don't know that that area too well, but I know that's a major problem facing a lot of people. Yep. How much simpler would that problem be if you had millions of dollars to help sort it out? Right, because you could. It just gives you more options, Dave. Right. Yeah. Like, it, hey, you're right. I could pay the inheritance tax and sell a property, or 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 keep it, you know, whatever, you know, it just gives, yeah. just gives you flexibility and you're not like, Oh no, what do we do? Yeah. At likely a disadvantaged position because you don't have options. Yeah. Exactly. There's blood in the water and you have to deal with it. Yeah. Yep. And then most importantly, I think it, it, it creates a wealth mentality that's transferred from one generation to the next and that, that stewardship. So if you're not a good steward, you know, you're not going to do well with money. It uh, doesn't matter how much you make. If you're not a good steward, you're going to end up broke just like everybody else who's making, you know, a quarter of what you make. You make 50 grand a year, you make 500 grand a year, you'll end up in the same position. Broke if you're not a good steward. That's right. You know, we've got some some friends that uh, that we talk to and, and they, they have good incomes, you know. Their combined income is probably 250, 300. And, uh, but I don't, I don't know where it all goes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, there's just a, something that popped into my head. It's just, uh, but then I've, I've know people that are on single income that pay super high premium. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, on one income, they pay super high premium relative to their income. So it's, it's just amazing lifestyle and, 
and that stewardship of, of their money. Mm-hmm. Hey, live for today. That's great. But I would save 25% of your income if you can and then live for today. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's how, how yeah. I would do it. But And a lot of that is passed down through generations. So, yeah. Um, all right, man. We've, uh, we've gone a little longer than usual here, but it was a good topic. I think we could definitely go you know, multiple episodes on this topic of legacy. And I think as I get smarter on the trusts um, and bring, bring in an expert perhaps to, to answer some questions and, and expand on that, I think it's going to be pretty valuable. So stay tuned for that. We'll do that this year sometime. So sounds great. All right, man. Hey, good talking to you. And uh, hey, like we always say, control your capital. Or somebody else will. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. If you'd like to have a conversation with us to see how you can become your own banker, or if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to tackle on a future episode, please send us an email to David and Paul at the ibcguys.com. And subscribe and leave us a review if you're on Apple. Follow and leave us a five-star review if you're on Spotify. And please share this with your friends. We'll see you next week.